life. Yeah. So hopefully people join. All right. Let me do uh, it. I got an intro. We'll do that and then we'll be right back. So. All right, welcome to this early, very early edition of uh, Rat Saddle Review. Usually we're not on until Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock p.m., but uh, we are on at 11 a.m. Yes, and you can tell because I have a paper cup of coffee today. <laughs> it's very early for you. <laughs> it is very early over here for us, but uh, hey, we'll, I'll wake up as early as possible to have Roland Grappow on Rat Saddle Review. Welcome to the show, Roland. Guten Tag, Herr Grappow. How are you? Yeah. I'm in sport outfit, but I'm not so much into sport. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No problem. Um, actually, we are here to talk about the, uh, this isn't the, the 20th anniversary of the album, but this is the original one, but uh, we're here to talk about the 20th anniversary of the debut album of Master Plan. And um, talk to me about, like, you, you 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 were with Halloween for a very long time, and Halloween is my favorite band. Everybody knows that on the show. Everybody makes fun of me because all I talk about is Halloween. <laughs> uh, but but to, in his defense, my favorite album uh, of all time from Halloween is, to this day, The Time of the Oath. So we're both huge fans. Cool. Oh, cool. Whatever it is, it's been the favorite. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many albums to choose, but uh, you did the Dark Ride, and it was a very dark album for Halloween and a very different band. And then, uh, you know, you, you guys left. I don't know. Did you leave Halloween, or did they let you go, or how did that end? Uh, yeah, we had a lot of trouble at that time before the album already, like six months before started. Mm. And then, then we were touring for this album for one year, and then we were fired. So it was 2001 in August, uh, I think August 5th. Oh, wow. like that. Yeah. All right. So then you were fired from Halloween and then um, we're, and then you, you you got a band together with uh, with Uli. And were any of these songs going to be for Halloween at some point or, or maybe for the Dark Ride or maybe for even the next album? Or how did these songs come about? There, there were many, many parts and maybe two two songs were meant to be for, for the Dark Ride. Mm. So one was uh, Step Into the Light, which had a different name at that time. Mm. Um, we recorded already drums, uh, my guitars and bass for this song, but uh, nobody was singing on it. So mm. just the pre-production vocals were on from uh, Henne Basse, which was a friend of Uli Kush. You know, he's a singer. He was in Firewind and many other right. bands, Met Metallium. Yeah. And uh, he's also a friend of mine, so we know him. Uh, he lives in Lüneburg, but at that time when I was in Hamburg living, we saw each other many times. And so this was a pre-production mixed with recordings already. And then some parts were already um, like from Soulburn, the intro part and the verses were also played to the band, but we never finished the song. Mm. And uh, so when we started a new band, then I had the idea for the chorus part which and solo part. So there was good teamwork after that. But there's maybe some other parts, uh, not for me, but from Uli, maybe some small parts were meant to be for Halloween. Okay. But not new material for the next album we, we didn't have. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, now, were you in talks about doing a band together at some point when you were still in Halloween? Because you actually worked on your first solo album with Uli. So was there any talks about maybe doing something on the side? Yeah, exactly. We we were touring, and and Uli was a bit disappointed that so many uh, good parts were left from from the Dark Ride session, and uh, then he, he thought maybe I should do a solo album, like naive on a tour bus, driving, drinking beer. <laughs> and we were always sitting. At that time, he was non-smoker, and we were sitting in front of the tour bus, and the rest in the back smoking oh. all the time. And so we talked a lot about this idea and we were listening to, um, like from record labels, we had a lot of, in magazines, this kind of um, promotion CDs, you know, on the tour bus listening. And it's nice when you have so much time, you know, and you can listen to some fresh new bands. And at that time was um, the ARC album came out with Johan Lande on. Oh, okay. And of course we felt in love with his voice and uh, we re remembered him later when we had the... <laughs> and... Uh, so at, at that time, we were talking about 
I said, Uli, I want also to do an, another one, but not this neoclassical again. You know, I, I did two. And I was a bit tired about it. And, and I fell in love with the Dark Ride recordings, with the idea. And then I said, maybe we should do something together. And then uh, he, he loved the idea. And then we were thinking about maybe let's, t let's think about a singer. And then we were thinking about R Russell Allen from oh. uh, CBX. Mm. And uh, this idea we had, very rough, just talking, blah, blah, blah. And then we talked to the other guys in the band, and I think they didn't like it. So, <laughs> and without telling us they didn't like it, they fired us after one year after the tour. Wow. Because we said, uh, uh, we try to get now our solo work is fine. Nobody said no. Mm. You know, kind of really surprised when we were fired. It was like uh, hugging each other on the airport after the last festival. And and I said, see you soon for the next uh, writing of the next Halloween album. And then at home, the email came. <laughs> That's it, you know. <laughs> oh my God! Wow. So then, then we thought, okay, we have to 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 make this idea even more professional. It right. was not really meant to be a, a really serious uh, project. Mm. Just uh, like emails. Solo. Yeah. Anyway, that, that that was the start of the band, and at that time, we had already maybe seventy percent written, you know. Mm. Russell Allen came to the on, I was flying after the last show to Los Angeles to to meet Roy Z and uh, talking about the material if you could help me and he was like a friend to me you know after the dark ride we, we kept friendship yeah. and uh, at that time uh, I was I think one week in Los Angeles at his place and then uh, Russell Allen came we, I paid a flight for him to, to meet me and uh, also, also Roy, and then he heard the pre-production, and at that time he was already singing some rough ideas on each song we had at that time, you know, right, right. and there was no lyrics, I was just listen to this, and then he was immediately singing something, and everything was so inspiring, and he's really good, really yeah. good professor. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, but then uh, then it didn't work out, because uh, two weeks later I asked him if he would join us, because we needed to form a new band, you know, mm -hmm. and we want to have a project. We needed a band on, his, on our own singer. And he said, no, I can't do it then, you know. And then it was sad. And uh, that's how it started. And we thought about the next singer, which could be maybe um, Mikey Kiske. I asked him as well. He said mm. no. Really? He was into metal in that time. Yeah. And uh, but he agreed to sing maybe one song, like a duet with our future singer. Mm -hmm. And then we started thinking about Johan Lande because we liked him so much on the uh, ARC album, on the tour bus listening session, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. It was very quick. So from August to October, we started recording already in October. So all the songs were written in, in the next six weeks. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Especially um, Pine Hearted Light, I was writing at the time, Heroes. And um, the rest, we, I think, Uli had one more song. After mm -hmm. after nine eleven happening at that September time at uh, that period, right? And he had some song. I I don't know which one it was. Maybe I have to lie. Maybe crawling from hell. I don't know which one. <laughs> don't so, but we were quick in October. You know, I I met Andy Sleep already a couple of months before on a festival in England, and I just contacted him. I liked his production and uh, his kind of attitude, and uh, so. He agreed to to record everything in my studio in Hamburg, and then in October we started with drums, and then slowly with guitars and bass. Bass was trouble because we couldn't find a right bass player. Mm -hmm. so on the end, I played uh, ninety percent of the album. Oh, really? Okay. The, yeah, that's how it started. Wow, really cool. I, I had what no was, idea Russell Allen was involved. Was that? Oh. Was it the question? I, I'm answering so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can take over the show. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep our mouths shut, please. It's, yeah. you... <laughs> but, it, but it's funny yeah. that you've had uh, Russell Allen in mind because actually Russell Allen and Jorn Land got together and, and did do, uh, you know, their yeah. Russell Allen thing. So that's pretty cool. It, it came later and later uh, the same with Jorn and Avantasia. You know, it's kind of yeah. weird, you know. Yeah. So how did you get in touch with Jorn? Did he like immediately like love love the project or did it take him some um, talking to? Well, yeah, I think we we started in September to search and uh, even with in mind that we were recording starting already in October, we didn't have a singer, mm. and uh, but we knew we, the arrangement was done. We had 
really strong feelings for the material already without vocal. And then, so I, I tried in September slowly contacting him in a way, but where? I tried mm -hmm. record labels. I couldn't find anything except uh, the French label. I forgot the name of the guy. Um, he had his label. Arc was on that label as well. So I was a bit in friendship with him at that time. It was like 20 years ago. And then he said, you can't get in contact with him. He's not answering anything, even when you have a window. <laughs> so the only chance was his uh, ex, um, not ex-girlfriend, now it's his wife. At that right. time, it was his girlfriend and Christine, uh, Christine London now. And I got in contact. I don't know if it was a telephone number or there was no Facebook at that time, nothing. Right. And so I, I contacted her and she promised me that she would call me back. And he did. And but it took a couple of weeks, so it, it was end of November that finally I had contact, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jorn agreed, Yeah, I'm interested. Oh, oh, let's let me listen, send me some stuff. I said, No, I don't send you our songs, they're not protected. <laughs> you know? I said, Come to Hamburg, I pay for the flight. And uh, he came, it was like one day, and uh, he came at around, around nine in the morning, 10 in the morning. We were Uli, Kush, me, Andy Sneep sitting there. And he listened to all the songs. We played it to him like for two, three hours. We had 16 song material, roughly. Mm. And uh, on the end, he said, yeah, I'm interested. It sounds really nice and I like it somehow. And uh, so maybe I can take this stuff with me and uh, write some lyrics because I wrote already uh, lyrics for Heroes, Ceylon, Kind Hearted Light. Uh, one more, I forgot. Four songs. I wrote. Uh, um, Nah, what's the song? Crystal, <laughs> Crystal Night. There you Crystal go. Night. So these songs are wrote already. They've finished the lyrics and the rest he made um, till end of January. Mm. So in that meeting, I asked him, we were quite finished already, two o'clock, something. His flight was five, six. And I said, do you have time to maybe sing one song? He said, yeah, which one? Yeah, we have one uh, label asking us to make a... Uh, the new band master plan could uh, have a song for the Led Zeppelin, um, um, like a cover song, you know? So we did Black Dog ah. already recording. It was done without vocals. And and he made just two runs, like listening, singing one, second, done. It was mm. amazing how good he was singing on that day. And uh, so we had already one song at the first meeting recorded with him. It was amazing. Wow, very cool. Yeah, he's he's an awesome singer. He's one of my top favorite singers. And I actually had him on a show maybe about two or three years ago. And he's a talker too. He, we talked for like uh, actually two days because he had to do something and we had to end the end conversation. But it was like almost a four hour conversation. And we just yeah. talked about everything and he can talk. Very cool guy. Amazing. Yeah. Go ahead, Lou. I don't, I don't want to take up all the uh, stuff. Well, I mean, it's just it's it's good to see you back in the public eye because, uh, you know, I, I admit I was late to the game in discovering Halloween as I told Wayne that my exposure to the band was when Metal Jukebox first got service to college radio. So oh, wow. we're talking 1999 and that was the only album ever. And and Wayne scolded me because he said, how dare you let your first Halloween album be an all covers album? And he told me, go listen to the rest of it. And I did and fell in love with it. And I have to admit, your songwriting and your playing um, I have to admit, for me, I found very inspirational when I saw the videos that were done. For, well, when I saw the video for Kids of the Century and I saw, wait a minute, he's playing power metal with a Fender Stratocaster. Yep. And yep. because of that, I now have two modified Fender Stratocasters. Oh, thanks okay. to you. <laughs> so, you know, I have I, I have to give you all that credit. But uh, what I wanted to ask you, being a guitar player and being a gearhead, so Sorry, Wayne, the gear questions come in right now. That's um, what made you at the time decide that you wanted to do uh, you wanted to play with Fender Stratocasters when you first joined Halloween? And I know now you're playing a uh, a gorgeous Gibson Les Paul I, with a with a maple neck, which is very rare, unless I'm mistaken. And it's roasted maple. But either way, it's like, you know, what made you decide to go with Fender Stratocasters originally? And what made you decide to switch to Gibson's? Ooh, it's hard to say. It was a slow progress. In the beginning, the first tour, when I, when I was stepping in for Kai Hansen, uh, we went uh, 89 to America with this uh, 
Anthrax and Exodus playing this festival shows there. I don't know, remember how many, but it was quite a long time, six weeks I was in America. And uh, I played still BC Ridge. So I was BC Ridge and Engel uh, uh, Amplifier I was playing, this German company, but very old model. I don't remember the name. And when I hear now the, the material, um, there's some, some good recordings from Japan. Uh, right after America, we went to Japan and uh, I liked the sound. The sound was absolutely fine. And I was already after the tour crazy and I made scallops uh, to the next for my guitar builder in Hamburg. But slowly I felt in love with the Strat. I mean, I'm, I was always a big fan of Richie Blackmore, especially when he had a good sound like like uh, made, made in Japan or Fireball, this machine head era. I love this kind of Strat song, this warm, sustainy, you know, which is really hard to get with this guitar, to be honest, if you if you don't know how to do it. And of course, true words never spoken. Continue. <laughs> yeah, and then, then of course, uh, I fell in love at that time with many gu guitar players. I wanted to learn something. I wanted to be better, and I fell in love with uh, Angry Mom's team, and uh, especially his very old sound is, is the same. You know, before he like Alcatraz, and even before, mm -hmm. this is my favorite sound he has. You know, and then later I said, eh, "What's going on? Why, why it changed?" You know, somehow. Anyway, I still loved it. I had many, many videos of him at that time, VHS uh, learning videos. Um, he showed some tricks and I, I tried to learn everything and, and I loved it somehow. You know, I was a bit addicted. And this kind of Stratocaster, you know, the sound was not easy to get in the beginning because I, I needed to get this pedal, what he used as well, the DOD 250. And I found it in America after um, mixing the Chameleon album. So when I found this pedal, then the, the sound was getting closer to, to his style. And for me, it was easier to play. And it's very inspirational. You play different on a Stratocaster, especially when I have Scallop and this kind of boosted pedal. And the Marshall, I always played on 10. I didn't get any sound uh, less than 10 on volume. <laughs> I had a, a little modification, which is not really a modification. I had a sand return built in, which had an active um, extra tube. And the volume knob so this kind of and power amp boosting i did extra you know i put a cable just linking in in and out and boosted this extra which made like the power amp a little bit dying sounding you know <laughs> i remember when uh, i played so loud that my cabinets mostly i played backwards because everybody <laughs> was complaining how loud i was <laughs> and um, then i remember there was an italian festival and gamma ray was there and, and kai Hansen came to me Man, your cabinet sounding like the, the speakers are dying. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but somehow I liked it, um, especially the solo sound, you know. But for rhythm, sometimes I felt, uh, maybe I'm on the edge, on the end, you know. Um, that's that's how I started, and I, I fell in love with it. And um, but when we started Dark Ride, you know, maybe I made one or two songs on, on the, all the albums I made with the Les Paul. I remember still we go up late. I was learning about more harmony guitars and I was inspired a bit. I'm not a big fan of Steve, Steve Vai, but I liked his kind of harmony playing and, and like Brian May had had in Queen many, many parts. And I was learning, I had some some lessons from, from a re really great guitar player from Hamburg. He, his name is Roland Cabezas, which is Spanish name, <laughs> except Roland. <laughs> and he's a great guy and he showed me in, in two months how to think about it. I was really uh, autodidact. I didn't know anything about theory. Mm. But this made a big step for me. And since then, I feel so secure about uh, making harmonies auto for master plan and then. And, and. and uh, when I when I did uh, Still We Go, I played a Les Paul. So nobody knows. And everybody thinks it's a strat. You know? <laughs> Yeah. That's what they. That's what they saw you with all the time. So yeah. Yeah, but life. I loved always this. Uh, how it looks like. How the felt. It's a pretty light guitar, you know. And um, then, I think many people liked the, uh, the the sound of the band that I had a Stratocaster and, and then the Gibson kind of Michael Wyker style, and it fits nice together. P people are still uh, missing it. Uh, many people write me about, especially the Fender sound I have and the Halloween sound. Yeah, but then, I, then then we had a meeting before the dark ride, and then the the band said they don't like my sound. <laughs> oh, jeez, man! <laughs> they said, uh, "Why you why you always try to sound like Ingvi and this and that?" And then then Waiki told me, "I love you how you played in Ram Rampage, more melodic, like Michael Schenker, 
Uh, with Gibson, I uh, had an explorer at that time from, from, from uh, Ibanez and later Gibson. And uh, so, I don't know, I changed. And uh, Dark Rider fell in love with a, with a kind of, I had many talks with Roy Z about guitar sound, especially the new down-tuned uh, tuning trick mm -hmm. we did. Uh, I used My Les Paul. Every, every song on this album is played by My Les Paul, the down-tuned part. And um, then I, I asked my old friend in Hamburg to give me my Flying V back, which you see on the, on the, on the If I Could Fly video. Mm -hmm. Beautiful uh, Flying V from uh, 1981, which I sold again. Um, I'm regretted it again. <laughs> so this this I played, uh, I think, 60% of all the solo parts. And for the faster stuff on Dark Ride or some other parts, I don't remember all the names anymore, but um, then I played Fender again, you know, because I feel more comfortable and I, I can play differently, like yeah. Apache or something. And, right. uh, and then when we started the master plan, it just kept it, you know, the Gibson kind of sound. Downtuned is just one song, to be honest, the Bleeding Eyes. And then we had many drop D tuning, but I fell in love with the Gibson kind of sound, with a with a Les Paul especially. And I don't want to to mix it on 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 the Fender with the Fender sounding Fender, you know, mm, for reason right. at least. That's now, how it starts. Now the the pickups on the strats that were you, that you were using were they stacked, meaning that were they single coils that were taller than usual? Because you know the, the problem that guitar players face with single coils is always that fifty cycle hum that occurs whenever you're in a hot light, and it just keeps buzzing and buzzing and buzzing and drives you absolutely crazy. But uh, yeah. it was it was a, what I loved about it was that it was a crisp and clean tone and just really cut through. So I'm wondering if your pickups were stacked. Yeah, it's a, I used a Dimasio HS3, like, same like Ingrid. So it's a it's a humbucker basically, and it's better cast of you know kind of style. That, that's but the secret, it, Wayne. <laughs> but I, I, I never tried really uh, for this sound real single coils to be honest it doesn't fit with the treble booster um i love the love the strong normal normal single coil for for bluesy sounds you know for clean sounds. yes especially on music i, I use real you know single coils direct in a, in a uh, ssl mixing board so i never used any amp for this part it sounded much better and direct you know mm. and um but also on the chameleon album we felt Especially uh, Mikey Kiske and me, we fell in love with Stevie Ray Wong. And I was listening, and all the time, this kind of life in Mukambo or Mukamba Club, or what the name is. This video is amazing. And uh, so he used normal strut uh, pickups. And uh, so I have also my 62 strut, which I used only on one tour on Halloween. I don't use it live anymore. It's, and uh, I have text special inside. So I love the um, normal single calls, to be honest. Especially when you have. Um, Try to get this old Hendrix sound or my, my other favorite guitar player, Uli John Ross, the Scorpion years. You know, when he had a, a Fat Face and um, what else he had? Yeah, Wow was Fat Face. And uh, so this is kind maybe of Echoplex. Was it Echoplex or Delay that he had? Yeah, he had a Japanese version. He had a Roland. Okay. So he, was, he was boosting a sound with a Roland preamp. And that's what he told me. I said, which, which kind of booster or what do you use? I didn't use anything. <laughs> you know, that's kind of it. <laughs> all the old guys doesn't say about their tricks, you know, same, you know, like others. But if you if you search long enough, you find it, you know, on pictures or something. You know, they yeah. use a lot of kind of um, echo, echo part, like Bam copycat for boosting the old marshals and stuff like that. And uh, so then I like the single calls better for this kind of sound, you know. There's not one trick, pony, or how you call it, you know. As it's always, you have to, you know, have some humbucker fender struts, you know, the, for the ink, um, at even Halen part. Um, I think this kind of HS3, I have just three struts. I, all in all, I have just six or seven. Mm -hmm. I had, at that time in Halloween, I had, I don't know, 20, 30. Oh, <laughs> but you mentioned the treble booster i did not know that so many guitar players in the 70s use a treble booster um i i i had i didn't realize that um tony iomi used them 
And now you're telling me Uli John Roth used them. And uh, by accident, I mean, I use uh, an MXR booster. And, you know, I even I have to admit, as someone who relied on a compression pedal for the longest time, I'd have to say, I think that the, the treble booster definitely adds more depth to the tone. So yeah, I, I could agree with that. Yeah, I mean, Richard Blackmore had this kind of uh, home by screws, which is a copy of Range Master. Um, I found all these kind of tricks very late in the, in the beginning of 90s. And then I contacted people and I was searching for the treble booster. And at that time already, I found one in Japan for 800 euro. I said, what? This, the parts inside is just for 10, 20 cents, you know? There's right. nothing. It's, it's, and now, if you find one, maybe you pay 3,000, mm. you know? And uh, oh, so I contacted. God. I was crazy about that uh, sound stuff in, in that time, you know, especially the Brian May sound. Brian May used the uh, Range Master. Yes. Um, uh, the blues player from England, oh God, Rory Gallagher. So he was inspiring uh, Brian May with his sound. He used mm -hmm. the same amp, the same booster. So he right. asked him. Then Rory Gallagher was recording in Dirk's studio in, in Germany. And I heard that, that uh, you know, George Lynch on the first album he recorded there used also the treble booster because it was owned by Dieter Dix. All these kind of tricks, you know, nobody knows about it, nobody talks really about it. Uh, Wolf Hoffman used Range Master on the old uh, Accept albums. Maybe he's still using it, you know. Mm. And uh, yeah. so many people. Well, I'm but a budget. Only, only John Ross didn't use it. You, you misunderstood me. So he had just the boosting of, uh, um, of the. Roland echo echo part. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. I guess I'm sorry. I did misunderstand, but that, you know what? That's the thing. Guitar players were always searching for the right tone, even if it breaks us financially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, being like in this new digital age, are you into like all those plugins and stuff? Cause you mix in and, and do your own recording too. So are you into all that stuff? Yeah, I felt in this trap. Yeah, so um, everything came out the last three years. You have to try, and then you buy it, and then you see the videos. Uh, you know, which sounding always incredible. And when when I have it downloaded and bought it, I said, "That's not so good." Like I thought. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I'm using uh, my camper in the moment was a good sound I got from Andy Sneep. He gave me uh, some profiles. And I fell in love with it. He gave it to me already six, eight years ago. Mm. But sometimes I try, and when I'm mixing a band for cheap money, then you know I, I don't reamp. I just use a DI signal. Mm. And um, but my favorite plugin is really an old one. I think it's TSA Audio or something. It's like uh, it's made in Russia. It's like XXS50 or something. It's a plugin uh, which emulates a PV5150. And for me, it sounds the best, you know, yeah. so far. And but no updates already. This guy's, I don't think, in business anymore. So there's no updates, and I'm happy it still works on my oh. new computer. <laughs> but uh, the new stuff is all good, you know, STL or whatever the other companies, yeah. you know, Borgren and then I, I bought so many and I regret it. You know, I'm always buying too many plugins. <laughs> now when you play live do you do you use like a computer to get those sounds or you still use your regular equipment yeah are you familiar with the fractal <laughs> audio the axis or anything like that yeah i had customers in my studio using it but no people people mostly get away and and then went to the campus site you know i don't mm. know why but i never tried it no and uh live yeah once i had the camper on stage and it was 10 years ago when i had it new and uh, the band didn't like it, and I didn't like it. Some something I made wrong, maybe I don't know. I was it was a festival with no sound check, and I took uh -huh. it on a, an amp and no time to connect everything and uh, tell what the, what I wanted. I said, eh, eh, "Don't do it again." So I'm using mostly um, when we do festivals. I ask for PV fifty one fifty one fifty or Defender version, uh, Eddie Van Halen version, and. Um, my old favorites are Mesa, Mesa Boogie, Rectifiers, Dual or Triple. And so sometimes, like, if there's a compromise, there's this uh, Polish company, La Boga, Hector, which is very good. So one of these amps I will always get on the festival. The worst case, only once in 10 years or twice, I got just a Marshall and I couldn't get my, my master plan. <laughs> 
Oh, because yeah. Marshall's mid range is sounding. And when I play this Enlighten Me, kind of da 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 da, this stops, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like very thin and <laughs> it's not inspiring, you know? Right, right. So, but, but for Fender and this old, uh, older sound, my, my, yeah, I call it Halloween sound. <laughs> um, I, I love Marshall for that, you know? And yeah. sometimes I'm blending it for solo over the parts and blending modern amps with the mid range of a Marshall. And it's a kind of trick. Uh, which which really fits well, you know, works well. Very cool. Um, we, you mentioned these this band before, Rampage. Tell me about. Oh, you have it. <laughs> I have these two. Yes, I had to search high and low for these things. Do you see that CD come <laughs> behind there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has it. He has it. Just letting you know that wrong. This people got more yeah. stuff than me. Um, I tell, all right. <laughs> um, tell tell me about like that that Rampage band. Like what how what, what was going on with that band? Yeah, so we were very young. I mean, um, I think when, when I was 17, I met these guys, uh, some of them, and they had a, I think they're one year older than me, both the guitar player and the bass mm-hmm. player. The, the bass player was the boss. His name is, uh, uh, don't ask me, Carsten Heyer was a guitar player and Jörg uh, Schädlich was a bass player and singer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were all singer, to be honest. We had uh, each solo solo spot and we were very good in harmonies and uh, so I met them and I saw them in a concert and the band of them called Bruchgefahr which means um, this is a, you normally get a sticker on your on your luggage or something, it's breakable, called breakable mm-hmm. oh, okay. uh, <laughs> and in Germany called Bruchgefahr and a stupid name but I think they got these stickers for free, that's why they had it <laughs> and uh, I fell in love with this guy, they had some good energy and the uh, bass player York had at that time really long blonde hair like Mark Farner of Grand Funk. And I was mm-hmm. this is cool, you know. Imagine this was middle of the 70s and there was not really big scene in, in Hamburg. And uh, the other guy also had long hair and he had already this kind of beard like looking like a rock star, you know, this kind of this side, side, I don't know the in English what the name is, side ones, you know, with a <laughs> mustache. And, yeah. and also, he was really good in English and everything. And I found out later, he says, one, one of his parents are from England. And that's why his name Haya, you know, Carsten Haya. So mm-hmm. it was, and uh, anyway, I met them later and then they, they heard me playing and they fell in love with my guitar sound. And then we started like one or two years later after this, when, uh, when we were around 18, 19, uh, playing together and, and creating Rampage. Mm-hmm. So they had they had a drummer, the friend of of Carsten Heyer, and problem was we wanted to be, we were already inspired by Saxon and uh, Judas Priest was mm-hmm. already big at that time, seventy nine, you know, and Scorpions of course, and uh, so we thought maybe we can do something like Saxon, Judas Priest, and then but more melodic like with harmony vocals like like Journey and Sticks. That's the other other side we loved, you know, yeah, and yeah. Total Foreigner. All this stuff, and said, "Okay, let's do this." And that's how naive we started, you know. <laughs> and we found really quick a uh, record deal, and and some um, the, the studio guys who recorded us, they they said, "Oh man, we can produce you, and we can work together for the future." And they saw the potential somehow, and we got a record deal through them uh, by mm-hmm. Teldec uh, Records, and uh, and uh, yeah, the, we signed some contracts with them, and I never got game on, never got money. <laughs> and uh, typical story, you know, and uh, and yeah, uh, it was it was kind of kind of challenging. It was we felt already like little stars, you know. We had a record deal, and uh, and then we started slowly working on the second album, and everything looked fine. But somehow I felt not comfortable anymore. I felt like this was not an equal band anymore. There's mm-hmm. the bass player, the the band leader uh, was getting too powerful. He went. Uh, as a job beside, uh, he finished studying and he went to the police mm-hmm. and cut it there short. And through him, we had a, a TV kind of um, one 45 minute spot uh, called between rock and police, you know, like a policeman, the kind right. of interest, but the conflict in the seventies. Now it's no problem. You know, now you have tattoos, they have long hair, but at that time he needed to fix his teeth, uh, short hair, no earrings. He had already earrings at, at daytime. And uh, yeah, no tattoos at that time. And that's why we made this. And then that was quite nice. So we've, we get a little bit famous in Germany. And uh, yeah. 
and but then I felt uncomfortable. I left the band already at the mixing mastering process after finishing, and we had a um, photo session. And on this photo session was already the new singer who which which was replacing me and the new guitar player. Oh, nice. And I said, the guitar player is not on the picture, but the singer. I said, well, why is he on the picture? He didn't even play. Right. And so after after I left, after the photo session, and uh, they recorded one more song for this album. And this was uh, the, the new singer and uh, the guitar players and uh, um, asked me. I'm really bad with names. But, uh, <laughs> I feel right. ashamed. I don't remember. But the You're guitar all right player, so far. <laughs> from Gamma Ray. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I know you talking about. Richter, yes, yes, yeah, yep. yeah. So he was uh, replacing me and this singer. So they needed two guys who replaced me. <laughs> wow. Anyway, and uh, they they played not long. I think one one more year, and <clears throat> so make this. I'm I'm talking too much. But the story. <laughs> That's was, why uh, you're here. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> the um, singer and bass player. Uh, was getting frustrated because he, his marriage was breaking up. Mm -hmm. Then he was fired by the police. Then I think he regretted that I left the band and everything went, went worse. He was getting alcoholic and really heavy. And after three years, he made suicide. Oh, really? And, oh. Uh, he was just 24, 25. And, wow. Uh, That's a downer. And the same year, or maybe next year, 26, uh, Carsten Heyer was dying as well. So he had... Uh, too much alcohol consume and uh, you got this um what's the name gastritis in germany so the stomach fucked up from uh -huh. too heavy like whiskey stuff and you know not beer he uh -huh. was drinking whiskey a lot also in that early age it's crazy yeah yeah uh what what, are, what is going on with, on this picture here with the little baby and everything yeah so the baby <laughs> is uh, the baby from the bass player so, oh okay all right so was oh. still happy at that time yeah. I thought the baby was the mastermind behind the rampage, just throwing everything around the room. <laughs> he just wanted to, to, they thought it's a cool idea to have a baby. Then I said, it's not cool. Did you see my face? I was like, yeah. Really <laughs> Wayne, that's not as bad as some of the 70s Scorpions oh, no. covers. I can tell there's, you that. There's worse. Yes, there's. <laughs> this is a very innocent picture of a baby. <laughs> I remember the, the baby called Zara. That was his daughter. And uh, after, after the divorcement, uh, she went, his ex was a baby to South America. Mm. So really sad. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to keep it on a sad topic, but uh, you were in the band when Ingo was still in the band. What was that like being with Ingo, like towards the, the end of his, uh, his life, pretty much what was going on with the band and him? Uh, it's hard to explain because when I joined the band, I felt there's something between us. Um, and in a way of distance, you know, like, I'm very easygoing, and I'm, I'm, I have a sense, really strange sense of humor, like English humor, like sarcastic sarcasm, you know. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, we, we knew us just two, three months, and we went on tour already, you know. And uh, felt a lot of pressure on me, not because of replacing Kai, because I didn't know Halloween before. Hmm. And six months before I was contacted by Waiki and, and he played me the stuff and I said, yeah, I, I like it. But he played me just the soft songs, you know? Ah, <laughs> right. Like like the ballad and uh, Future World and I Want Out, that's it. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> and the stuff, uh, the other stuff I heard later. But he said, here is material, uh, learn it and then Christmas you will join the band. So I will, I will take care about it. I said, mm. But he's still in the band, you're touring still in Europe. Anyway, and then when I came and felt um, who really didn't like the situation was Ingo because he was the biggest friend of Kai. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they had a lot of private time together as well. And yeah, so I, I tried to get always very close to him, but it was not easy. And on tour, I always tried to talk to him. And I said, what's going on? Why Why I can't get... Everybody liked me there, you know? No problem with, with, right. with Michael Kiske. Or Waiki, we had a lot of talks, and uh, but then I realized two, three years later that that he's sick. You know, he had this kind of um, schizophrenia, and uh, that he started, you know, crying on stage in Japan. It started like we had to interrupt the concert in the middle, mm -hmm. and uh, we were all, what's going on? And then 
we finally found out what's going on and then he had a break from the band for another year and uh, we gave him like a, like one year for for getting treatments and we we went on tour with other drummer like Richie Abdel Nabi mm-hmm. which was a nice guy as well really nice <clears throat> and uh, anyway there was this time when when the year was over and then he came to me in my my house and he said yeah i'm fine again i'm totally fine you, know, you had short hair you had a big beard really and, wow. yeah he looked totally different and then i said also you gained weight maybe for me- medicine or med- you know, medication or something i don't know mm. and uh but then i said okay yeah okay i will talk to the other guy but i was not the main guy in the band i don't know why you came to me you know mm. anyway i felt he was not better he talked fine for 30 minutes and then the next part one one answer of my question was like oh, what's going on with him you mm-hmm. know I was, mm-hmm. I was like oh my god nothing wow. changed yeah anyway so it's like sad situation at that time you know? yeah and always people are writing he's mr smile but he's just smiling on the pictures and when, when the camera was there but he was not always smiling right you know? right yeah that's why I, I had i had a d- different a hard time with him you know and mm. uh, for me it was easier to hang out with mikey kiske and mikey and marcus yeah 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 definitely uh and also, also i didn't take drugs and uh, that's why i was bored i was a boring guy you know <laughs> <laughs> i think that's how he saw me you know i i, I like to drink a beer that's it and uh but i i heard that he took some stuff which i never saw you know right 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 but I was driving him sometimes after the rehearsal to a part where he was meeting the people and, and buying stuff. And I, I didn't didn't know what it was, but I heard this about later. Mm. So, well, was like, yeah, that song Step Out of Hell was kind of, I guess, wrote, written for him in a way, right? Yeah, this is kind of a Rampage song, which I reactivated. Oh, that's, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Actually, you had a couple of songs from Rampage. You had that and um, um, uh, what's the other one? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so I thought uh, I write this kind of lyrics about him, and because it was victims of rock, the name was before on the rampage, mm-hmm. and step out of hell. I was writing about his situation, and I hoped I could help him with this kind of message, but yeah, it didn't work. Mm. Nah. That's a shame. Um, uh, Richie, you mentioned Richie. Uh, did he actually record on any songs or anything with you guys? Like any B sides or? Yeah, B sides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know the names, but my song was Oriental Journey, instrumental okay. song. Oh, that he was played. Richie on the drums. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, he did some more. some All the bonus tracks for this period, I guess, yeah. Oh, very cool. What do you think about those, uh, the Pink Bubbles Go Ape and, and the Chameleon album? To me, I love them. The fans, are they're, they're really split on those two albums. What? Do you, what? <laughs> I wasn't crazy about them either at first when I heard them, because, again, when you're listening to the albums in sequence and you go from Walls of Jericho to Keepers to Pink Bubbles and Chameleon, and you're like, is this the same band? But mm-hmm. I can say going back to it at a later time and realizing these are some of the best songs that the band has ever recorded in their entire career. I mean, I I, I don't think I can make a playlist that includes Halloween or Master Plan without including The Chance or Mankind or Step Out of Hell or anything like that. So, sorry, Wayne, going back to your question. No, ask the question. Um, <laughs> he knows where it was, a, it, was a, it was a tough situation at the time. You know, I, I just didn't understand it as well. You know, I joined the band. Mm-hmm. We played live all the good stuff from Keeper 1 and 2. And as an encore, we had, you know, from Words of Heracles, is uh, I don't even remember the name, but one song, you know. Oh, uh, and, uh, how many tears? Usually, how many tears? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I thought that's right songs. I mean, it was a pre- delay of some problems with a record label we had at that time mm. before Pink Bubbles came out. So I wrote then uh, first song was a chance. I wrote then I think someone's crying, and then mankind and uh, back. Back, back on the street was a kind of rampage song already, mm-hmm. which was not sure if, if, if it's on the on the rampage album. But I like this riff. It was from Kai and um, Kai, I said, Carsten Heyer. And uh, 
I said, okay, I write here some heavy metal. I try to replace a guy who wrote a couple of cool songs. Yeah. And then a few, what's going on with Waikie and Michael Waikas? <laughs> so there was, people doesn't know, but for this album was already a windmill written on this, for, which is late on Chameleon. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, we had three versions out of it. Really? And, yeah. I still have it somewhere here. And uh, oh, You'll have to send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Pay up, Wayne. Inflation. And then, and then, uh, then, then I had, of course, at that time, I started speaking English quite okay, you know, after some years. And I was talking with uh, Chris Sangaridis and then the management. And, and they, they, nobody understood the situation. Why, why they went away from the metal parts, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a couple of songs like Heavy Metal Hamsters, okay, but but if you have a windmill and then just your, you know, I think your turn was also already written for, for Pink Bubbles. Hmm. And uh, so it was really hard, you know, a lot of discussions and uh, I felt these two guys wanted to go away. They talk all the time about Beatles, about uh, the band Queen, mm -hmm. and which I like as well, but I thought this is not clever to change it when the new guitar player is on the first album, you know. Yeah, because you kind of get the blame in a way because people thinking maybe you changed the band. Yeah. Yeah. So I write the metal songs and there's these guys, something different, you know. <laughs> anyway, I liked, I liked the album, but it was a hard time because there was a lot of discussions and not fighting with me, but fighting with the management about why you're doing this and why you change. And then after that album, it was getting more and more in this direction, you know. And then I even started joining them. So that's why the whole Chameleon album is getting so bluesy and soft and like elements of 70s, like Revelation, um, isn't yeah. it? Is this Revelation? Revelation, yeah. yeah. From Bucky, yeah. So I like this. All, it's all cool stuff, but it's definitely not Halloween style, you know? And uh, then later we thought maybe it should be like a solo album of us three, you know, because we wrote all the songs. And, I'm uh, sorry, it's a Revolution. I'm sorry. Revolution. Not, Revelations uh, from the Dark Ride. You're getting them all confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, you are, Wayne. <laughs> Anyway, this is like uh, one step further. And I, I agreed and I, I was fighting. I did my best and I worked really close, especially with Mike Kiske and because we fell in love with Stevie Ray Vaughan and I wanted to imitate this bluesy sound. I wanted to imitate this Brian May sound. Every song sounded a bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, then we started touring after that and I felt like, what's going on? <laughs> the, fans were, the fans were strange, you know. Yeah, they were yeah, just yeah. listening. I, mean, I think we had a set of mostly from the Chameleon album and uh, not not from Keeper 1 and 2. Right. And we had a lot of acoustic songs. And I felt, oh my God, <laughs> I felt a bit lost on stage, you know. Right. And when we went to Japan, I saw even girls crying. Not for, yeah. not for joy. <laughs> ah. They thought, what is this band? Yeah. And uh, I agree. I, I, I love the arms. I'm happy I was part of it, you know. But uh, in that moment after the tour, it was in Japan. I said to Waiki, I think it's better to to change something, or I, I maybe I should quit because mm -hmm. I felt I'm the new guy in the band, and I people think I'd destroy it, you know. Right. Yeah. And then Waiki said, No, don't, don't, don't leave the band. I take care of it, you know, because they talked just about Beatles' next album, even after Chameleon, right. more and more. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> then, then we, we lost already a record label, you know, EMI right. and said, what are you doing? You right, know? right, yeah. So, and, and uh, so Waiki took care about it and said, okay, let's change the singer. And that's why Andy Darius came. So that's how, how everything started. You know? mm -hmm. Were you f uh, familiar with Pink Cream 69 before Andy came in? Uh, of course, there was a lot in, in, on MTV and radio and, and stuff. And yeah, I checked it out, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that started like an upward trajectory. I mean, you think about the four albums that came out in sequence, Master of the Ring, Time of the Oath, uh, Better Than Raw and Dark Ride. I, the, Wayne, admittedly, those are four of the strongest albums in the entire discography. So, yeah, yeah. that's beautiful that, that, that uh, you know, many people writing this. and But there are a lot of people say, this is my favorite album. This is my favorite. Dark Ride, some people love it as well. And for me, it's my favorite, you know, it's okay. it's like a good ending, you know, everything went 
strange at that album. That's why it's called Dark Ride as well. And, and, and it's an honest album. It was a lot of fighting, a lot of bullshit going on. Mm. And a lot of pressure for me. Um, the Dark Ride I wrote at the recording on the last second because they wanted to get rid of me again. And uh, <laughs> this talking. Yeah, yeah, they talked about it already. And, but the inspiration was not so easy, you know. But mm. with the help of Roy, he pushed me and said, make, make something strong now. This should be like like the main song on the album. Do something like that. A longer, longer track with many parts and changes. And that's what I did. In two weeks, I did it. Wow. So I wrote it and then, <laughs> then I played it to Uli first and, and Roy, of course. Yeah. And, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, this is great. And then the other guys, hmm. It's okay. It's not so bad. <laughs> it's kind of great to me. <laughs> but, see, no, but, but, but I'm happy that, uh, especially these four albums you mentioned, it's, yeah. it's uh, you know, yeah, it's just one of those albums. It's two of those albums that the fans, the fans really just you know they either love it or hate it. You know, I I love them because they they were actually the first two albums that I bought on CD. You know, because I finally got a CD player and I'm like, you know, I have the new Halloween albums. You know, and I was the coolest kid in high school back then. You talk about Pink Bubbles and Chameleon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just you know those two albums are great, but um, yeah. Uh, I know you got a another interview coming up. Do you have a little bit more time before the other interview? What's the time? It, it is here, it's, uh, uh, 11.56. I have it at 7, at 7 o'clock. So. Yeah, I have shopping. Well, 7 Hello? o'clock your time. So. Yeah, time, yeah, so you got time. Okay. All right. I'll let you ask some more things before we head out of here. Yeah, still, still have one hour left, I see. All right. All right. Yeah. Very cool. Um, So I, I know in the 90s, there wasn't much touring in the United States because heavy metal was a dirty term back in mm -hmm. back in the states around that time but i did watch some of that footage of halloween one second my dog wants to get out of the room go puppy <laughs> my dog is <laughs> um i know that uh halloween um had some great live concert footage from the 90s that i still love watching to this day but there was one show that halloween did in new york in uh. 1998 at uh, Coney Island High, which is unfortunately no longer there. I wanted to ask you, uh, what were your recollections of that show in New York City? Um, something I don't remember is so nice. It was not a good show. It was not a good show. I, I mean... I know it was overbooked. There was... It was, no, the problem is um, we had trouble on this uh, tour in South America. I think we came from South America to New York, and it was the last show. And our our gear was um, not stolen. It was locked at the customers. Mm. Oh, jeez. All my guitars were on tour. I couldn't play because I had to rent um, from, or from, from support bands, getting every gig different guitars. And the same was happening in New York. So I got the horrible guitar somebody gave me, which is not scallop, which is not um, right pickups, you know. It's, it's like a Squire to... Bullet instead of an actual Fender Stratocaster. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I remember I had in Brazil when, when we played, the guy gave me a silver self-painted Stratocaster. So, and the neck was loose like this. <laughs> and the volume knob was, was like, <laughs> and the live switch wasn't working. I said, like, oh my God, what did I get here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Panic! <laughs> this feeling on stage, and many, many uh, videos are out, and people were, were thinking, why, why the band is so unstable? Sometimes we're great, sometimes not, because this was not our equipment. And yeah. I remember I was uh, throwing the guitar, like I always did, you know, at that time. This kind of black moss stuff till till the you know the spots and the light, like three five meters up, with a cable. And then I grabbed it again like this. And I did a couple of times. And the guy was standing next to the stage watching me like, My <laughs> <laughs> he was not uh, amused. He was very, very, <laughs> he went to our roadie, which taking care of the situation. And he was, he has to pay for my guitar if he breaks it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but unlike, first of all, that was a very good American accent. Number one. Number two, um, <laughs> unlike Prince, he takes care of other people's guitars. And not yeah. breaks them. So, yeah, yeah, I, I saw the video when he did it. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, was, uh, New York, me. coming back to New York. So, 
the 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 yeah the cake or the ice on the cake or whatever how you call it was I got a new roadie. Oh, <laughs> you know, roadie is like a guy. You should trust him hundred percent. He's he's uh, taking care about your instruments, about your equipment, the yeah. tuning. He, he knows, knows what you like. Yeah, exactly. That, um, should have a good guy when you pay so much, you know. And this guy was a star roadie. He worked for David Gilmore. He worked for Paul McCartney, <laughs> but not for metal bands. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> so this guy guy came. Hello, I um, don't remember his name. And he came in very nice suit, and this. <laughs> and he worked. He worked so bad for me, you know. Yeah. He, he, I said to 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 the management, I don't want to work with this guy. You know. <laughs> I was hoping this would have had a happy ending. <laughs> it's New York. Well, and this, <laughs> it is New York. That's how I remember the show. So I, I think it was not the best playing or something or the sound. I don't remember. I was not happy. Yeah. You're coming. Uh, to, that's many times I had this. You know, I have a chance to play one good show. And I remember the first time we went to South America, it was in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, Iron Maiden headlining and some other great bands. And we had 45,000 people. And then you co go there. And my roadie, which I had before, said he worked with me i think uh the first five years or something then i had a new roadie which was amazing and they wanted to save some money and he said i'm the tour, man uh, tour manager or, or stage manager i can take care about your guitars again you know but he didn't uh. know that i was down the whole band was down tuning half step <laughs> <laughs> i know where this is going he gave me a normal tuning guitar for the first time. Uh. I said, do you see this on video? When I when I watch this, <laughs> people should sometimes uh, read your minds what you're thinking on stage. Yeah. What the f is going on? So, <laughs> just, just about saving money and management uh, decisions. I I was looking like loser on stage. I felt like a loser, you know. <laughs> Managers everywhere. You cut corners. That's what you get. Okay, just letting you know that. Now well, I don't have a manager. Now I don't have a roadie. So I to do everything on on everything stage alone. Wrong. And it works. <laughs> but <laughs> that should lead into something good. Um, yeah. From what I heard, uh, Master Plan is going to be going on tour with Firewind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the uh, end of February we start. I think it's for three and a half weeks. Yeah, uh, 19 shows first. That's oh, awesome. Okay. It's glad to see you back on the road again. Yeah. Then, then some festivals up planning uh, to come and we just booked uh, uh, for November like a metal cruise in Greece we just announced it yesterday or yeah and more stuff is coming I think we go to South America or to maybe I should not say it as a package with Firewind and uh, it's a plan it's not booked so far but we're planning end of the of next year so we will have maybe around 50 shows this whole year pretty good for us you All know. right. We'll love to see that come stateside, definitely. Um, yeah, is, there, is there any talk about that coming to the States at all? We can need something good here. Not so no? far. <laughs> I think we just played proc, proc Power in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. Only show we had. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. uh I know Firewind announced yesterday, America. I didn't mm -hmm. know we could join them, but uh, the right. same package. Fingers yeah. crossed. But I didn't mm -hmm. know about it. We gotta, we gotta get on that. Yeah. <laughs> what were you saying, Luke? Before I cut you off, go ahead. No, I just want to ask him one question. Uh, I just Only really, one. yes, one. I wanted you, <laughs> you start. I continue. You go. Then I go. Then you end. That's how it goes, Wayne. No, I like to interrupt you instead. Yeah, well, like now as bad as some of our <laughs> other co-hosts. Um, but uh, I just really wanted to compliment you on your songwriting. Um, aside from your amazing guitar playing abilities. Um, your songwriting was what made me gravitate towards you as a player. And I love the fact that on every album that you do, you show a different side of your writing style. Like you could write something that's very reminiscent of early Van Halen, such as uh, Take Me Home to uh, something that is just, you know, melodic and just grabs you by the heartstrings like The Chance or... Uh, you know any any 
I just I just love the fact that you're a, a well-rounded guitarist. And I guess when it comes to your songwriting, when when it comes to prepping for an album, do you have a set idea in mind of what you're going to go in and do? Or is it sort of, OK, I'm in writing mode. Let's see what comes out. Uh, it's not so easy to answer, to be honest. Why do I, I always I think... ask the hard questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the the problem is I, I, I it's not so easy to convince myself with songwriting. You know, I need always something special to to feel. Oh, this is different. This is cool. If I like it, uh, doesn't mean everybody will like it. You know, but but I don't want to write just songs which sounding like like every, every other power metal song or something. You know, because. Even I'm known as a power metal guitar player because I was in Halloween and people call master plan power metal, which I think is not really power metal only. But right. I'm, I'm coming from totally different points. You know, my heroes, you know, like 70s style. And then later when I was getting serious as a guitar player, I was really big in Toto, into Toto and Steve Lucas. You know, that's why you hear many p parts of my solo parts are stolen from him, you know, inspired by him. And I uh, still love love his style and uh, never met him, by the way. And um, but then Eddie Van Halen accepted tapping, which I was never a really big fan. I just used it sometimes as a color, you know, as a trick or making one note or something. But I love especially also his rhythm style, you know, and his sound always. And uh, but when I start writing, especially on, on the old older master plan stuff, I was always thinking. I never wrote a song just for by guitar. I always started with a keyboard. It's weird, you know. I need something like a uh, or drum drum part, and um, or I have my collection when I when I have my my uh, collage, you know, I'm, when I have my all my ideas on some tape. And now it, now it's in the computer. It's like a lot of stuff from the last thirty years still I have, which I never had time to start something. But when I listen, I said, uh, you know. When you have 20, 30 ideas and only one makes it to to inspire you to start making a, a song out of it. Mm. And sometimes I'm thinking, I like this, but I still, maybe next album, you know? I don't start with, before I have the really the feeling, that's it. Now I want to do it. And uh, for me, it's, it's, it's really easy to get some great ideas also from other guys and finishing it, you know? It's like, like Soul Burn. I, I said to Oli, this is a great start, but it was never finished. And then I came with the ideas of the chorus and the uh, solo part. And then it was a round picture for us. And uh, that's why we were maybe a good team. When that, somebody has just fragments of a song and I, I feel the inspiration, you know. Right. And But to inspire myself, it's not so easy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why it takes so long. And uh, the last uh, why people asking me, oh, why are why we not releasing more arms the last 10 years? It's because I was uh, really busy with my studio. I started 13, 15 years ago, working for many other bands and uh, fell in love with kind of uh, mixing, mastering kind of stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, now I'm mixing uh, the new new song for Master Plan. Okay. I think I will send it uh, today to the guy who makes an animation video or lyric video for us. And this will come out in January. So you see... You're not only as a, a guitar player nowadays. Now I'm I'm managing the band. Yeah, you're the, yeah. <laughs> and I'm on roadie on stage and um, uh, booking flights for for the shows and and you know you have to do everything alone on on our level. And uh, on the other side, I'm also mixing, mastering, and recording. And so it's kind of a round job. And and uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I was just a guitar player and writing some songs by <laughs> by mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny I, I guess we're gonna have we me and lou are actually in a band together uh called severed angel and we have a new album coming out uh next year that's our first album but we're gonna have mm -hmm. uh, around january we're also gonna be having an animated video come out as well so i guess we're gonna have competition lou oh, oh okay. I, I i lose i will gladly <laughs> give up the throne to roland i'm go i'm cool i don't know we'll have to have a i'm not worthy <laughs> we'll have the to have an animated video off <laughs> The first song we bring out is definitely uh, not a typical master plan first song release, you know, because we always had this kind of more mid tempo, more lost and gone, and and you know, keep your dream alive kind of songs. 
mm. or back for my life, you know. Right. And this is more and more like kind of a, like an anthem, a bit fast, not not too fast, but a bit, yeah, typical. You can sing along kind of easier. And I thought that for the first time, because now we make the plan, we want more single releases before the album comes out, which is normal nowadays. Yeah. And maybe the second song is then a really brutal, uh, faster, untypical master plan release as well. And I hope we make a real video for this uh, second song, which should come out before the tour, end of February. So that's a plan. And then after the tour, the album comes. Oh, very good. I'm, I'm glad to hear there's some new, new music coming because it's been a while since the last album. So Yeah, we yeah. missed you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Jorn was on on the first two albums on this album, in Aeronautics, and then he left the band, and then he had Mike DeMeo come in the band. What was it like working with Mike? Mike DeMeo? Yeah. Um, it was... Working on the album was really easy, to be honest. Mm. Um, I remember we talked basically mostly on on the uh, internet before he came to my studio in Slovakia and uh, I told him maybe he can write some some lyrics already some vocal melodies and he came with half of songs I think five six songs he did already some some work and then he played it to me I said Mm-mm, huh. that's not what I wanted that is too bluesy it's too far away from our style so we worked uh, then very, very close in the studio and very quick. Mm -hmm. All the 10 songs, I think it was just two weeks. And he's very good in that. And when you give him some some idea and uh, trying it out and see what, what's going on and like a team playing, so he was very good. And uh, we made it, I'm, I was lucky we made it quick, you know, yeah. because he was singing then the next couple of days. I think we was, were working on one song half day and in the evening he was singing and then we're done. Each song like one day, you know, it was yeah. pretty good. It, and I was happy. A, oh. Of course, of course, he has a different style. He's he's not so brutal like like right. Johannes or, or Rick. Right. I liked him, and uh, especially live, I was he was a bit uh, even more more cleaner to be honest. Not not so rough like on the album. Mm. And uh, we were talking a lot, and then on the end of the tour, we played in Korea, and then he was so powerful and so. I said, you sound like totally different. Yeah, today I thought I'd give more, more power. I said, Why do you sing always like that? I said. <laughs> this is Mike DeMio who was in Riot, correct? Right, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. can I tell you something funny? I just saw mm -hmm. Mike DeMio in concert recently. Guess who mm -hmm. he was performing with? No idea. Do you know the, do you know blues. the, Pop. not even blues, Tommy James and the Shondells. Moni, Moni, Crimson and Clover, all those songs from the 60s. Ah, okay. I think We're yeah. Alone Now. That was covered by Tiffany. Mike is yeah. his keyboard player now. <laughs> and singing background, of course. Wow. Yes. I know. Yeah, My baby does keyboard. the hanky-panky. Yes, exactly. That stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. good. It was a good concert, but I was like, no, that, that can't be Mike DeMio of Sons of Society era Riot. No way. But it was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but he's a cool guy. He's just it didn't didn't click really. It's it's um, you know the German kind of guy is metal power metal, and he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. I think it's also why why Jorn has trouble with it. You know, he's not into this double bass fast right. songs. And, uh, yeah. and mm -hmm. we're still good friends. But also, by the way, he did Time to Be King. So we made mm -hmm. three out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, yeah, mentioning about the time to be king, like you just said, Yorn wasn't into like the fast double bass, but there was a lot of double bass stuff on there, it was a lot of crazy stuff. So, why did he join, finally like join, want to come back to, into the band? Uh, for time to be king, yeah. Um, no, no, we changed a bit. Uh, he said, but I don't want this, I don't want that, and then uh, I made, made a compromise and made the songs a bit more to his kind of um, you know, how he liked it. Mm. I mean, not changes like I don't like this, and then I change it. No, but I, I knew he didn't like uh, this kind of um, like stuff, like Eagle Fly Free or something. He would not like it. You know, mm. Mm -hmm. and uh, he's he's more into this kind of uh, yeah bluesy. He's into classic, yeah the bluesy stuff. Yeah, yeah classic rock. Like Panky like, Panky. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I I'm not taking anything away from his talent because it was a fun show, but I 
it's hard to realize it's the same guy. Hey, he's gonna make money, man. I agree. I agree. <laughs> if you're a working musician, you gotta make a living. Absolutely. Yeah. Who knows? If somebody asked me to play in a famous pop band, <laughs> <you know? laughs> we might see Roland Ooh, playing. Yeah, Hanky, Hanky. Hanky. <laughs> Roland Grapound, Tom Jones, coming soon to a festival near you. Oh, yeah. that would be all. <laughs> that would be normal. I love his voice. <laughs> it's not unusual. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> so then Yorn ended up leaving again. So, like, how did you have like a, a relationship with Yorn, or did that kind of get soured between all that? We never spoke about it. He just uh, didn't answer my messages, and we met uh, two, three years later in Israel, or maybe five years later. And then we spoke and had fun, hugging each other, drinking, and no. And they said, <laughs> He said to uh, he said to me, you know that I never left the band, yeah. I said, yeah, but you never answered <laughs> my messages. <laughs> so this is the kind of humor we have. So he's somewhere in a, in a nowhere land, hanging, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Who the... does he think he is, Ron Keel? I never got kicked out of Black Sabbath. Give me a break. Oh, this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh... No, no, we're still good friends, and I, I asked him some months ago about some some business, uh, you know. For my solo record, some some I had an offer for a record label from a label, and I asked his opinion how, how his um, experience is, you know, uh, and he said, "Be careful." <laughs> 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 so it was a good kind of, uh, um, yeah. I think there was yeah. never any trouble with him, you know. Yeah. He's, a, he's the kind of guy. He's he's a lovely person. You know? mm-hmm. Oh yeah, like I said, I at the beginning of the show, I had like a, almost a four hour conversation with him. He was just a really nice guy. He couldn't he couldn't talk to me more more, you know. He just wanted to keep going and going and going. So he's he's a very nice guy. Yeah. Um before we get going, I got you two solo albums. Uh I love this out. I love both of them, but I I love this one because I love this one the most because you're you're actually singing on this. Um, and I think your singing was really good. Why did you decide to stop singing? And it didn't really stop, you know. I always had the passion. I mean, I, I started singing at the same time when I started playing guitar. I mean, I was inspired by Mark Farner, so he's my first kind of inspiration or idol. And uh, I think in Rampage, I also was singing, and uh, a lot of people said they loved my voice in Hamburg. You know, at that time, nobody was singing like that. Right. There was just Klaus Meine from Scorpions, which is different. But I had more this kind of clean, Mark Farner, bluesy kind of phrasing, soul inside, you know, and like this. Come on, everybody, well, have a good time, yeah. This kind of stuff. And nobody's singing like this in heavy metal, you know. Right. <laughs> but then later, of course, I met, uh, worked with Michael Kiske, and I was inspired of his different technique. He, he used a certain technique, you know. You can't sing so high without mm. uh, thinking about something and learning something, you know. And uh, he was inspired by Geoff Tate and, yeah, Helford, of course. Yeah. And maybe, maybe Bruce Dickinson as well. And uh, so I, I fell in love with his style as well. And I tried to learn it a bit. And I never reached the level, of course. And then I tried it on the solo album. And, uh, and I thought, okay, it sounds pretty cool, but something is missing. But okay, but people should be happy that I sing and they should be surprised. Mm. And, uh, there was really, really 50-50 kind of opinions about it, you know, especially right. if I was on the internet, maybe then I would <laughs> read it like the same day already, like getting frustrated. But at that time was one guy, he worked for Rock Art Magazine in Germany, and he wrote, it's a great album, but you should stop singing. Really? <laughs> that, that, that made me so frustrated that I stopped for a while. I yeah. was singing harmonies in Halloween, of course. but Right, right. He said, um, next album, I, I, I asked Michael Vescara. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's how it started. And it made me really insecure. Mm. And if somebody tells you, you, you have a great album. Nobody was complaining about my guitar playing. Right. But my singing, which I was, um, you need self-secureness. And, and some, something breaks your self-secureness. Then, then it's hard to get it back, you know. Right. And... Uh, now I sing all the demo parts uh, for for our new album and to send it to Rick and and uh, so I don't feel ashamed about it, you know. But 
a few auto reaction of my wife sometimes. You, know? oh, you should not sing high, sing low. I love your voice when you sing low, and I say, but I want to sing high. You know? <laughs> sometimes these wives get you in trouble, man. They have their opinions, but you know, we know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> but, but to be honest, she doesn't like any of these guys who sing in high. Right. Maybe, exactly. maybe that's, she doesn't like uh, this kind of heavy metal high singing. Yeah, you know? of course not. They usually do. I should not ask her. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my favorite vocal performances of those of yours was um, when you did "Closer to Home," the, uh, oh. the Grand Funk Railroad song. That was the, one of the first songs I heard you sing, and uh, it, it just blew me away. It's just awesome. I love that. Cover. Yeah, we have both a live version. Um, we played acoustic guitars on a on a Master of the Rings release. Mm -hmm. And we played the whole band acoustic except fully played drums, but and I was singing it. I wanted to release it soon. It's it's like a good memory. Yeah. So I just rescued uh, many tapes last year. I spent many months uh, rescuing all the live tapes from from Halloween, and I thought, you know, every time we played in Hamburg was was recorded by my my ex wife. Oh, and uh, I said, why why you should not release it? You know, it's like wasting to keep it just so many years. Mm -hmm. lock do, do you think they'll ever release that stuff? I I try next year, yeah, when yeah. I have more time. And mm -hmm. uh, but this song I maybe mix mix over Christmas, something yeah. like that. And it's uh, not the whole concept because uh, just this song, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah I'm excited I, I to hear it. I was I was singing this song in on in a studio in Hamburg um, at uh, two three in the morning. Wow! It was the, it was the last part we did, and uh, I was singing. Not tired, but the the recording engineer fell into sleep when I was singing. <laughs> I said, "Wake up!" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, then I, of course, uh, I was proud coming home uh, with the recordings and played it to my ex-wife, and she said, "Yeah, but normally you sing better." Really? Said, okay. really? <laughs> yeah. Because it was in the studio with a uh, you know with when you know a lot of people watching you and stuff and. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of you know it's it's a very sensitive instrument and uh, you sh should feel comfortable or you should sing at home alone. It's the best yeah. nowadays you can do it. You know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I sing in the shower. So, yeah. <laughs> Lou, you got anything else? Yeah, is that what you call it, Wayne? Okay, yeah, never cool. mind. Okay, <laughs> no, I'm good. Uh, this was a such a treat for me to be able to talk to uh, Roland Grafau. A big fan, big lover of everything you do, and glad to see that you're back and. You know, glad to know that you were busy with recording other artists, but glad that we'll be able to actually hear music from you again next year. Definitely more, yeah. Master plan. I'm also thinking about making some solo work and I'm singing again. Oh, yay! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing, nothing neoclassical. We don't need this anymore. We have. Are, we, have you, have you given up the neoclassical <laughs> stuff? Like, you don't want to visit that again? Ever? Everybody's doing it now more than before. I don't have a. Yeah, no, uh, there's nothing inside in me to say do it again. I don't. Yeah. I love to play at home. You know, playing this kind of scales. I'm still rehearsing to be able to play it, but I don't want to write these kind of songs. It's, it's, I want to have my style and uh, maybe some more bluesy style. Not bluesy like boring bluesy, like like mm. metal rock blues. You know, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Let's see. I'm not easy to convince myself. I told you, but it's like oh, I told you both. <laughs> It's something I'm searching now, right now. What what can I do? Like uh, like the King's Act or something, you know, this kind of style. Mm -hmm. Um, this kind of great guitar sound I like as well. So something I will find, you know. I have a lot of lot of songs already left, which we're not using for Master Plan, and uh, I don't want to keep people waiting so much again, you know, like ten years. Yeah, yeah it's been too long. So, uh, do you still have contact with Uli? Because he left the band as well. So, do you still talk to yeah, him? Or? We have we have the last 10 years we were, we were writing messages and I, I met him in uh, it's already one year ago in Norway we played I think my battery was empty <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah we have recently contact always like uh, you know, twice a month we're writing messages something like that yeah uh, but he's, fine. He's, he's having his job in, in Norway and uh, he's I think he's happy with everything mm. did he like completely stop drumming because I haven't seen him do anything I think he's the kind of guy who's drumming for one year, not, not at all. Mm. And then he comes back two, three rehearsals and he's great again. Yeah. He's amazing. He did the same in Halloween. After touring, he stopped playing for six months. Really? And I said, how is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> he's and, just that good. 
like picking well, up a bike. I think I think when you get some some offer from some bands, he's he's doing studio work or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool, very cool. Uh, just a few more things. Um, was there a name for the band before? Because I remember you had a contest to name the band Master Plan. Was there a name that you guys had in mind before uh, somebody picked that? No, there was a long search. I, I, I remember three, six months searching for name. And uh, I had a list of 100 names. And uh, there was nothing I remember now. But uh, the idea came from uh, some guy from Mexico. A fan who wrote me private and said, yeah. hey, you know, you're, you're master musicians and you have your future and you know in front of you now. Why you don't call yourself master plan? I said, oh. mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I asked Olio, what do you think about it? And he loved it. Yeah, so that's why it's so easy. You know, some fan helped us to find the name. Yeah, yeah, it fits perfectly. Uh, and speaking of fans, I actually have a couple of fan questions. There's just one guy asked me some questions he wanted to know from you. Uh, this is from Hiro Morita. Uh, he mm-hmm. said the, the live DVD just came out with the bonus disc for the uh, 20th anniversary of the debut album. Uh, is there any more pro shot videos from the 20, 000, 2003 tour? No. No. Okay. There's, some, there's some stuff. Uh, yeah. it's uh, In Japan, we had some one or two concerts recorded, but the audio material is so bad that I don't mm-hmm. want to post it. Yeah. It's, it's good video quality, but... Um, there are a couple of mistakes. I don't want to show this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, get I think it. I did on YouTube one uh, little part. It's a bass and drum solo. I, I, I posted that. People can find it down under my name there. But I don't want to have unfixed material. We have also uh, from aeronautics to a really good material, but it's also not fixable because there's no audio extra material. Jeez. Uh, is there? A, did you have uh, Jorn sing uh, the chance at all during any any of those tours? I said he wanted to know if it was going to be on any. That was in Japan. We made made a medley of three songs. Okay. And he was singing the chance like um, one minute, not not the whole, thing. <laughs> not the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and is there any? We just talked about this. Any uh, plan to release the Aeronautics 20th anniversary? Um, for me, it's not really hundred percent sure because I think. The first album was special for me because it has this video material mm. and i don't I, I thought it's not fair to my my lineup now to release a dvd for the fans and saying here this is yawn this is uli and i think that it makes only sense to say it's it, it's part of the anniversary mm. and people can see something special how the band started right. and bring, bring an audio anniversary after 20 years now i think it's, it looks like a money grabbing kind of idea which I think the band doesn't see any money, but the record label, you know, and uh, but it's for me it was just a wish to release a video, and I, I just put the put the idea together the first album anniversary. That's all. Yeah. It is. Good, uh, good, good answer. Because a lot of bands like it, they want that that cash grab, but you know it it doesn't hurt well, to get the cash. You know? I don't mind if they bring this vinyl <laughs> again. They did already aeronautics, but mm. MK2 was never a vinyl, as far as I remember. Mm. And uh, people still ask him when it's coming out, and I think it will come out sooner or later. But AFM is, uh, you know, always busy with other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his last question is: uh, He heard that the, we talked about this uh, about a new album coming out. Uh, is it going to include any um, songs like "Heroes" or "Wounds" or anything? Uh, yeah, not not a copy of them or mm-hmm. something like that. But... Some yeah, two three songs we have kind of this direction. Yeah, okay. well, is there is there a name for the album yet? Not really. I, I was thinking about you know this kind of metamorphose or metal morphose, something like that. You know, I just wanted to make something special. First, I had the idea to continue with this kind of four elements we had started in the beginning, mm. but uh, nah. I should not do this, you know. <laughs> but I don't know this like uh, air, and the first one was all the four elements. Right. Then I thought about water and this, you know, earth, and man, yeah. it's over. It's a, it's a different lineup. So we should continue with what we have and make just nice, fun records without thinking so much about the first two albums, you know. Yeah. Because everybody says it's the best. It's the best. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's some statement and on some special time we had, you know, we had a lot of kind of anger and uh, disappointment feelings, which has mm-hmm. helped us to write some really crazy, crazy good material, you know, sometimes yeah. help, you know, it's, 
But now we have different situation and different lineup. Yeah. yeah we totally. do what we do. Yep. So Master Plan, 20th anniversary. Do you have a favorite song over this album or you just like them all the same? Is there like some one that you like really love the most? That's like asking him to pick his favorite. I know, child, I know it's man. hard, but Come like, on. it's 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 tough, man. It's it's an awesome album. It's gotta be like that one song. Yeah, ask me that. I mean, there's soul, there's, there's spirit never dies, there's crawling, there's kind hearted light. There's so many good songs. There is, you know. I'm I'm proud about every song on this album. It's it's funny. It's really funny. Yeah. Well, Roland, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this. I it was really I actually asked you to come on the show maybe like two years ago, but we just couldn't find the time. But I'm glad we finally did get the time because uh, you're one of my favorite guitar players and you were in one of my favorite bands. And now you got the master oh, plan. Thank you. And what, oh, what Roland, are you, where are you going? Roland, Roland. Is he going to the bathroom? No, I think he thinks the interview's over. <laughs> and he's gone. I don't think he left. He's gone. I don't know. <laughs> well, that well, was a it's weird live, ladies show. and gentlemen. You have to expect this. <laughs> well, thanks, Roland, for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, he went to go to his next interview. But uh, thank you for watching the show. Um, everybody, please hit that subscribe button. And we also started something now. I don't know if I can get rid of him or what. I don't know. We'll let him stay. Casey, come oh, back. now you want to get rid of him. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, maybe he comes back. Uh, but now we have this thing going on. I don't know. Just stay tuned because there's going to be these uh, tiers that we have. You can uh join the chats and you can be like the special person in the chat and we can like uh you know uh, acknowledge you in the chats or you can like suggest us to do certain album versus albums or just uh, about a band or whatever show you want to do and you can also join us on the show that's but, right we're monetized bitches yep so check it out. i don't know where it is on this youtube thing but look and uh it'll be there somewhere and uh we're still figuring it out ourselves yeah, it's it's brand new to us, so it's on there somewhere. So if you want to have a little bit more fun with the the show and want to be more involved with us, then please, you know, take uh, take advantage of that. And uh, again, thanks, Roland, for coming on the show. Go uh, check out the new 20th anniversary of the debut Master Plan album. It's going to be really cool. You're going to love it. And uh, that's it. Yep. And also, don't forget, go to SeveredAngel.com, buy a copy of the album. Merch is on sale at 40 percent off until november 28th so buy our stuff that's right buy our stuff because we need the money uh we have another album coming out we have to pay for it so you have to help us um and anything right. oh join me tonight at 10 p.m eastern i will be on freeworld.fm and i'm going to be doing uh oh roland's back into the room hold on hold oh, on don't did? go anywhere don't go anywhere <laughs> something something happened I might be left again. Well, I'm not here yet. <laughs> Wayne, you disappoint me. Anyways, I, I disappoint you. Where is he? <laughs> he's coming. He's, he's, I don't know. What happened? Everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> we, we were trying to say goodbye to you. You just did, took off. Did you have to go to the bathroom? What, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> he went off again. Sorry. Yeah, I am. I think you talked uh, you're one of my favorite guitar players and then my yes, mobile yes. went <laughs> Yeah, oh, all right. <laughs> all of a sudden we saw you taking over and running. But uh, that's the end of the show. Go go charge your phone and you got another well, interview. Roland, do, thank so. you so much thank for you coming much. on the show and best wishes to you. See you soon, hopefully. Thank you very much. Yes, all right. And take care. And everybody, please subscribe and go buy the Master Plan uh, debut album, 20th anniversary. And we will see you guys next week. Bye.